Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Kurt Martin. Uh, Kurt Martin is the Vice President of Design and Marketing at Landscape Forms. He leads the company uh, through product development, marketing, and marketing communications. He's a multiple award-winning industrial designer skilled in furnishings, communication, design management, concept development, and design thinking. He's also a graduate of Kimmel College of Art and Design, and he's also studied at the Royal College of Art in London. Uh, his talk is entitled, Research-Driven Design, Reinterpreting the Intersection of Work, Learn, Play in the Built Environment. Join me in welcoming him. Okay, thanks for having me. Um, so yes, I'm an industrial designer, and so it's, it's interesting to talk to a room full of architects and landscape architects uh, and students. Um, what, I, what I would want to start with, just to kind of get us into the headspace of being here and now, uh, how, many, how many people have one of these in their pocket or on them, right? Okay, so when I started uh, my career 24 years ago, um, no one had these. We had desk phones. And when you went on an office or when you went on a business trip, if you were to stay at a, a, a hotel, you would call home or your significant other when you arrived at the hotel, and your company would frown on, on you doing that because those phones were really expensive. And so you could only limit the call to a few minutes. Um, and you might go, consequently, a couple of days without talking to someone at home or a loved one, which is really crazy to think about now, but that's what's happened, right? Significant changes from an innovation standpoint have kind of occurred in our everyday lives, and we don't even think about it. So if you were to say to me 20 some years ago, Kurt, how many people will have these in their pocket uh, by the time you're you know, 47? I said, oh, you know, I don't know the number. They, and if you said, well, how many, how many people would have these compared to indoor plumbing? I said, well, everyone would have indoor plumbing and only a few people would have these. Um, you know, these things are seven, 800 bucks. And it's just hard to believe that we all carry them around, at least this model, right? And, and it's happened. More people have these in their pocket than they have indoor plumbing in, in the planet, which is amazing. And, and the reality is, is more people have phones than, or actually there are more phones on the planet from what I've been told than people, which is really interesting. I mean, this is like an internet machine, a computer, a FaceTimer. It's pretty incredible, um, the changes that have happened from an innovation standpoint in this aspect of our life. So another thought, um, how many of you are going to go on a vacation for a couple of weeks, maybe in the next year, right? So what's that look like, right? If you ask 10 people about their next vacation, how many of them do you think will say, I'm going to spend two weeks indoors, right? How many, how many people do you think say that, right? There are places you can go, like the Mall of America. It's all indoors. You don't have to go out one time, right? It's a horrible outdoor. Um, people don't say that, right? Or how many of you have been in New York? Or, great, uh, Paris? Some of you love New York. Uh, Chicago, right? So let your mind's eye take you there, right? And then what is it that you, what you're doing? What are, what are you seeing, right? Pretty interesting thought. If you ask 10 people that question, when they describe some of their most exciting experiences of place, they tend to do it from the outdoor perspective. And to me, that's really interesting. They almost never say, I'm sitting in this wonderful room with interface floor tiles and Ames aluminum group chairs next to this wonderful Noel conference table underneath floss lighting. They almost never say that. They, what they do say is, I'm outside, I'm smelling it, I'm seeing it, I'm feeling it, right? They think of place from an outdoor perspective. And I find that to be fascinating, right? Or in Michigan, where I live, when you get to the age where you're thinking about retiring, you know, for this room of my dear grandparents, for me it may you know, be a lot closer than that, and for others, it might be right around the corner. Think about uh, where those people choose to live in retirement. In Michigan, it's almost further, it's almost never further north. And why is that, right? It's the weather, right? It's that connection to nature. Well, who in their right mind would go further north where it's colder longer, cloudier longer, grayer longer, snowier longer? There's one in the back. <laughs> There's a couple. <laughs> It, it, it's an option, and, and I can't say everyone's going to move south, but the vast majority of people pick to spend their most precious time, their most valuable time, vacation. They think about uh, space or place 
from a fond memory perspective, from an adult perspective, and I find that to be fascinating. And it's not research, it's just an observation. And I challenge you to try it at some point, right? So just ask so them you know where they're gonna go on their education, where they're gonna retire, and think of, about a, think of a place from a fond memory, uh, of, that you have a fond memory of or a perspective. So, I wanna hop on this, and without fail, here we go. So our company, was founded by a landscape architect uh, in 1969, and we're an office, or actually, uh, we're a site furniture company. My background is in office furniture, so that's kind of ingrained in my person. But we're a site furniture company. I've been with the company six years now. Uh, and our, uh, our company was founded by a landscape architect who didn't want to lay his people off in the winter. So he began to make furniture. And some of the furniture in the building looks very similar to what he started doing. So this is a creative person who started a company that's now, I think, $112 million in sales, which is really cool. Our current president is an architect. The president before him was also a landscape architect. So the company is about to always be run by creative people, which is really cool. So if you think about uh, other companies, manufacturers, they're fine, fine companies, but a lot of them are run by finance people or salespeople. Um, not necessarily true creative people like an architect, or a landscape architect, or industrial designers. So this is John Tippin in this pack, and it was really cool what he did. And we, we continue that legacy. We're, our company is known for three things, design, culture, and craft. We put design first in everything we do, every decision we make is filtered through design as the number one lens. So we'll take less margin on the, on the product um, if it means uh, sacrificing design. Our culture is core, our people are everything. Um, we put them first as well. Um, and then our craft. So we have people in the plant, and I hope some of you in this room can come visit us, that have no idea why we would ever want to work in an office when they get to weld and actually build stuff all day. And I hope you get to meet them. So it's about design, culture, and craft. What I want to share with you, though, is our design process. So even our board members will ask me, Kurt, how do you, how do you come up with the ideas of what it is you're going to, to produce or manufacture? And more importantly, how do you know they're the right ideas? So at our company, we have a metric. And the metric is uh, for the marketing design team annually uh, to hit 25% of all new revolved products sold have to be five years or newer. So that's a little bit of pressure. So it means a little over $25 million each year has to come from new products, or products that are five years in newer. If you know anything about product design, it takes like three years for them to really ramp up. And you know, I don't have a crystal ball here at the team. So you really have to do your homework on what it is you're gonna design and why you're gonna do it. So I'm gonna take you through that process. Then I'm gonna show you uh, projects that we've done recently using that same process. And then I'm going to show you a couple things that are coming and then take questions. So from the product design process, I want to look at the sources, where the ideas come from, what are programs, what are the types of designers that we work with, um, what does our ideation process look like, what is search and why do we need it, and then design development. So from a source perspective, you know, uh, we look at our competitive uh, set. So one of our main competitors is Forms and Services. Um, another one is Victor Stanley, on and on and on. Um, we look at what they're up to, just to keep an eye in the rearview mirror. Um, we look at market demand. We do consultative reports. So one of our um, big efforts this year is a research project with BMW Design Works, which has an office in China, an office in Germany, and an office in LA. And we kind of triangulate kind of global perspectives on what it is we want to do from an outdoor uh, site furniture and lighting perspective. Uh, we look for um, <coughs> observational research. We look for human behavior to drive a lot of what we do. So our teams are constantly in the field, observing behavioral patterns in the transit market, the educational market, the healthcare market, the corporate campus market, and so on and so on. Uh, we also look at customers and end users, what they're buying, we look for technology trends. Uh, we look for um, input from the field. So our salespeople that are out there are always at front line, uh, from an input perspective, we have what's called a design advisory board, which is made up of landscape architects and a research uh, designer. So we have that meeting twice a year, and they come back to me and say, man, you guys really nailed that one, or you really messed this one up? 
So it's really important for our company to be really close to architects and landscape architects specifically from a trend perspective and really understand and have empathy for what it is they're uh, trying to solve or the problems they're facing. Uh, and then trade shows and conferences, 431 trends. 431 is a group of engineers at our company that does only really uh, premier projects. So if you go to Central Park, you'll see all of our products there. If you're in New York, you'll look around at any bench that's in the city that came from landscape forms, almost 90% of them did. Um, and then our lighting team. Uh, this is an advanced team of engineers that goes out and does lighting plots uh, for big installations. So we actually do follow-ups with them. And then roundtable events. So we bring together once a year a group of uh, principal level architects and we give them a problem to solve or we talk about or we pick apart a, a current problem that they're facing today and we produce a white paper on it. And then the same with what we call the Extreme LA event. So we hold these, I think the last, in the last three years we've been at Virginia Tech, uh, Kansas, uh, K-State, UC Berkeley, all over. Um, basically giving to young people and young professionals an opportunity to work with some real seasoned folks. We give them a, 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 product, a problem to solve, and then we watch that, that whole kind of design strategy process happen, and we produce a paper from that. So let's dive into one, one as an example, the educational market. So in 2016, last year, we went to 22 different colleges and universities, and we had wonderful conversations, and we did a little bit of observation work on various campuses, and uh, with uh, either the, the facilities manager or the landscape architect on staff or the architect on staff. So we went from anywhere from Boston College to Duke, so in anywhere in between Boston College to Duke. Um, and it was pretty eye-opening what we found. Um, we've done, uh, uh, we had a lot of good work and feedback come in from a demographic standpoint, from a branding standpoint, from a technology standpoint. So we're trying to pull it in. Anything that we can find uh, to, to understand what they're facing in their industry to help them better uh, is really important. So from a demographic standpoint, um, there are differences between small, uh, small universities and large ones, or uh, public universities and private universities, and what are those differences and how do we respond. Um, we looked at funding, collaboration, uh, sustainability, product insights, and then we kind of net it out, right? So this is what the design team responds to. So probably a lot like the work that you do here. We kind of net it out and we say, listen, what is it we're going to do and how does it embody what we found uh, in all of these interviews from traveling around the country and trying to know uh, what's really happening out there. Uh, we also do student observational site studies. So we just, uh, did recently, this one speaks to one that we did at Michigan State, where we'll, we'll pay a young architect uh, to go out and observe their campus for three weeks, roughly. And we typically point them into specific directions pertaining to public space or shared spaces in the outdoor uh, campus, take pictures, do their own research uh, or observation, and then bring that back to us. We then share it with the actual uh, campus themselves, or the college institution themselves, and it's pretty eye-opening to see from a student's perspective how they're experiencing the campus. We then take that information and we share it with all the other folks that we've met with, the other 22 that we've met with. So we kind of, in aggregate, kind of put it all together and share the info. This one I like a lot because it's kind of unfiltered. It's really interesting. Um, we have wonderful partnerships. So I mentioned to, to someone earlier today um, we work with people that devote their life to really understanding um, the effects of nature on human health. And this is a person that's, that's doing that, Dr. Warber with U of M. And people like Terry Clements with Virginia Tech, and some of you may know, may know these people. But it's really important. I would say you are who your friends are. And if you look at the five people you spend the most time with, you're essentially looking at yourself. And from a company perspective, that's the same, right? So. The partnerships you have, the connections you have, um, are, speak highly of, of where your, your standing is and what, what your goals are. So these are all people that we work with to create uh, either white papers, uh, CEUs, case studies, but more importantly, bake it into the product design and the marketing. And why do we do that? It's really to help landscape architects. 
And what, one of the reasons uh, we do so much of it is at a time in human history when more and more people are moving into urban areas, we think, we believe that these spaces are going to become more important than ever, right? So if we don't really understand what's happening out there and we're responding with what we did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, I would say we probably won't be in business in the next 20 years. The reality is, is yesterday's solution will not solve tomorrow's problems. And back to my phone comment, the reason why I made it. Innovation is touching every corner of our life, and when I look outside, I see, some, I see places that are 30, 40, 50 years behind. And to me, that screams of opportunity, right? So that's pretty cool. So when you think of your work, think of how good it could be in these, uh, in large part, overlooked spaces. That I would also say are some of the least expensive spaces that anyone can invest in, especially if you do a simple side-by-side -side comparison. So take this building, for example. Take the square footage cost of it times it by how many floors you have, and then do the same thing when you go outside of the yard, right? And tell me what space is more or less expensive by the time you want to do something with it. It's just interesting to, to us. So, so we take the information that we pull in from all of the, uh, the work I just mentioned, and we create a design brief or a program. And that's really about building a business case, kind of getting a sense of what it is we think we might want to do. This is what our form looks like. So anyone in the company can write a business case or write a program, which is really cool. The only rule is you have to be an employee. We believe at Landscape Forums that good ideas can come from anywhere. So if you're a salesperson, write a program. Don't just lament you don't have the right thing, write a program. If you work in the plant and you see something that's not working right, write a program. We don't expect everyone to be an expert in the, the numbers side of this. We'll help them. Um, and we, again, we don't oftentimes know what the lines might be anyway, so we just kind of project on how something uh, would sell or how it wouldn't. But this is what the program looks like. And in this case, we have a product line called Chip and Chair. It's doing really well. And we wanted to add um, some lounge pieces to it, some additional tables. So I'll show that in a minute. So once we write the program, uh, we then look for a design partner to help us. And we oftentimes love to work with architects and especially landscape architects, because who better to serve landscape architects than other landscape architects, right? So there are four types of design entities that we look at. The first would be solo flyers, the next would be firms, uh, after that would be alliance partners, and then the internal design team. So these are all people that can design stuff. And if you're mean, you gotta hire someone to design something, right? Keep in mind, you gotta hit your metric. You're 25 million a year at this point for us. Um, who are you gonna pick? And what are the pros and cons to each one of those folks? So the first one I would start with would be a solo flyer. Um, solo flyers are wonderful. They're passionate. You oftentimes develop long-term, sometimes lifelong friendships with folks that are kind of independent designers, oftentimes working out of their home. Um, the, the, the upside is they're inexpensive. Oftentimes they don't require a tremendous amount of money, at least in the beginning. The downside is uh, they lack uh, the organizational kind of support or structure, right? So some may not know how to do uh, computer work or renderings, right? I mean, we're working with people from all generations. Um, they may not off offer the support they need just internally. They may not understand enough about your business, and they may not, or your industry that you're serving. Another downside is, is they just are too small to have kind of a, that ability to do the research to really know what they need to know. They need to read more. Um, the next one is to design firms. These are, you know, the BMWs of the world, the frog designs, the IDOs, and, man, you know, what's not sexy about that? Well, I'll tell you, the cost, incredibly expensive. You know, if you're willing to spend, you know, two to $700,000 on a, on a product design concept, I mean, that's putting a lot of money behind an idea. That's a lot of faith. So they're, they're typically really, really sophisticated people. They're, they're dressed really well. They're really sharp. They're sparkly. Lots of them uh, are attractive, you know, like really fun kind of corporate entities. But again, the downside is there's a lot of personality issues. There's a lot of layering in there. And when we start a design project, it may not go quickly. It might be 18 months before it's done. And oftentimes, people on that corporate system are moving through so fast we might circulate through two or three teams of people. So just from a day-to-day -day getting stuff done, they're just challenging to work with. And then they have their own hierarchy within that system, so everything has to be approved by some big cheese on the top, right? 
So there's a lot of pluses to that. There's a lot of, of, of negatives to that. Again, another plus might be just their name has so much brand value alone that it could help us, right? But then the other side of that is, is you have to get approval for everything you do and say about them, or every ad you run, or everything you do that has anything to do with them is a drawback. So that's an interesting thing. Alliance Partners. Um, we have a lot of those. We work with Saints and Cole out of Barcelona, Spain. We work with Esco Vet um, out of Barcelona, Spain. Corn and Gate, we just acquired them out of Phoenix. Um, we do work with LeGrand. We do work with Tucci Umbrella. All of these people are amazing brand leaders. And the upside is really cool because we get to kind of, we get to leapfrog off of that wonderful success that they're, they're having and reputation. We oftentimes don't have to develop all the insights and uh, product knowledge around what they're doing. We just jump in right away and get going on it. Uh, the downside is we make less money, less margin. I'm not a nonprofit. We have to make money a certain amount to keep all of our men and women employed. There's about 500 mortgages that we pay, you know, every month from all of our employees that work there. So the pressure is on. Um, so we want to make sure we're making enough money to keep that moving. Um, and then there's also uh, challenges with just alignment on strategy overall, where there could be issues with bringing products into the country and how much does that cost. So there's some interesting kind of thoughts there. All of these things that I deal with on a daily basis weren't really taught to me in school. You kind of learn them as you go. It keeps things very interesting. And then there's the internal design team, which I love those guys the best. I'm one of them. Uh, but the reality is, you know, we're, we do things on the cheap, right? We do things really quickly. I like to think we're super lovable and a lot of fun to be with. But the problem with that team is they don't get out of Kalamazoo enough, which is where we're located. And if we truly want to compete on a global level, you kind of got to get out of your, you know, your office once in a while and make that happen. So when we work with outside people, one of the biggest pluses is we get to bring in their materials and process knowledge. It's kind of a crossover scenario from other industries. So if we work with a designer, we just got done doing uh, Nest, in which we did on the walls, uh, you know, the, the thermostat Nest. When they come in and bake it into our thinking, we Again, we benefit from that as a company. But the internal folks, not so much, because we're doing furniture all the time. So then we move into ideation after we've hired someone. Uh, we've developed three to four concepts. We call it never falling in love with a puppy. You can't just do one concept, just like you guys. You probably have to do a couple before you narrow it down. Uh, and this is just a real brief kind of uh, example of what that would look like. So you start with a simple sketch. We quickly mock it up. This is Bob Chipman. He's a landscape architect, but I think he's one of the best industrial designers and product designers I've ever met. His products consistently sell more than anybody else's, which is amazing. His real job is a rock climber. This is this guy actually uh, hangs off of uh, the mountainside in those little kind of hammock tents and sleeps all night. I mean, it's the stuff this guy does is absolutely amazing. So a certain amount of months out of the year, he'll actually design furniture for us, and this is him using construction foam from Home Depot that he glued together to sculpt out this chair. There's no better way to get to know what it is he wants to do than to build it himself by hand. Then we move into uh, scanning it, and then we move into uh, 3D printing it. So this image at the end here is really just a small little 3D print. And then we do our market validation. So that's called search of landscape forms. What that means is we bring our ideas and so you guys have critiqued here and know this will be tough. Let me tell you, um, critiques can be really tough when people really don't know you that well, right? So we do the same thing. We bring our ideas out. We bring two or three concepts out and say, what do you think? We go to the top design firms around the country and we ask them what their opinion is. And let me tell you something about designers and architects. Guess what they are? They're paid to have an opinion and boy, they share it. So we take those opinions and we make them uh, into magic, we hope. So that's really important for us. At the end, uh, what we're always doing is we're always elevating and refining our processes so we can do uh, things we haven't been able to do in the past. Typically, we fly all around the country with the same presentation, two or three people would give it, and then we come back and compare notes. We still do that because nothing beats face to face. But what we do now is we use go-to meeting, we use customer fly-ins, we use anything we can to also kind of understand what it is um, people are looking for. And then lastly, we take all of that information. We, at that point, hopefully have a wonderful concept uh, that we can refine. We've created an amazing mock-up, and then we give it to our engineering team, pending executive approval. So the whole company has to be aligned on what it is we're going to do. 
So that's really important. So that's this all happens before we go into the engineering team and say, okay, folks, here's what we want to do. So that's how it works at landscape forms. So here's a little recap of it. And let me show you some products that we've done using this process. So this is called the Go Outdoor Table. This one was really based on all of those learnings that we had from college campuses. Um, what's really important here is we want to give people a place to go that's not a table with an umbrella, right? So this thing is on and off grid, it's solar powered, or you can hardwire it. It has this canopy structure on the top, which really doesn't have anything to do with keeping wind or rain off you. It's really about spatial anchoring. It's really about allowing people to feel more comfortable in wide open spaces that they have something to anchor themselves towards or with. And if you, if you look at human behavior, you look at human, uh, humans in outdoor spaces especially, you'll see them anchoring themselves towards something. You'll even see a Costco. If you have a Costco here in the pizza area, you know, they have tables with umbrellas. People set up those things first, even though they're in a building. There's no reason for it, but you see that behavior all the time, which I think is really interesting. Human behavior is a nonstop fuel for design, I think. It just gives you so much inspiration if you're a keen observer. So here's the same table without the canopy. That works well too, but it should be adjacent to something. Here we are showing it at Western Michigan University, which is right next to us. We tend to use uh, local areas to do our photo shoots. Here it is at our airport in Grand Rapids from a transit application. And here it is showing, you know, it can accommodate technology. So our stance on technology is not to incorporate, embed it or uh, integrate it because technology moves so quickly. Our stance is really to accommodate whatever the technology is of the day. So this is an outdoor monitor on this side, and this is a power station, or a power receptacle on that side. This is what the light would look like inside if you were to hardware it. This is what it would look like if you were to have it solar. This is the solar panel. So pretty simple stuff. I mean, this really isn't rocket science, um, but the table looks really cool. It's different. It gives people a place to go, uh, and it supports how they want to be outside today, which is interesting. This is a partnership we did with a brand. Again, it's not an amazing design, but it's the first in the market. So it's a partnership with a power and data infrastructure leader based out of France. I think they're over six billion euros annually, which is pretty amazing. And this just allows people to have power outside. That's not coming off a conduit and bolted onto a building. Here it is in, in national use. This is one of our first customers, University of Waterloo in Canada. These are our tables, multiplicity. These are actual students like yourselves doing work outside, which is really interesting. Here's again Bob Chipman. Here's the chair I talked about. This chair is, uh, I call it lightning in a bottle. It's an outdoor table, table and chair collection, uh, all cast aluminum. It's all welded together in ground, so our craftspeople are really good. So you don't see the seams anywhere. It doesn't rust or corrode. We're adding this lounge chair and these tables to it. And this is the process. So half of this line is already existing, the other half's coming. Andrea Cochran, the fiber landscape architect. I want to be just like Andrea. Her work is amazing. She's a super sharp person. She's also on our design advisory board. Um, she worked with us on a, a program called the Co Cochran Chair. It's a lounge program. Really clean, really simple. And for us, this was really nice because it brought in uh, a mesh, outdoor mesh material. And you know, our company's identity is really tied up in benches. The reality is we sell more tables and chairs than benches, and we always have. Um, but any time you can work in a new material like this outdoor mesh um, is a good, good opportunity. And also, high performance concrete, which these tabletops are made out of. This, this is my second to the last project I want to talk about. It's called Converter. And it's, it's based on us observing lots of dead space around the country that's underutilized, whether it's on a campus like this one or a municipality somewhere. Um, we looked at uh, dead spaces. So this is a really bad picture here and out there too. So this is the same space on the left that was transformed uh, on the right. And we're looking at spaces like this that are everywhere. And what, what do they do from an economic perspective, from a community perspective, um, for the good? So we've, we looked at these spaces from a time perspective, the amount of people, uh, the types of social interactions that would occur there. And then if we were to do something in these spaces, what would be the price? Um, so the, what we did is we backed into it. 
Um, we sent a group around the country to observe successful spaces uh, and spaces that were not so successful. And come back to us with insights or the kind of the ingredients list of a successful space. So this was really fun. Uh, what I just showed you is we start with kind of talking to people, getting a sense of what it is they need, and then we kind of come up with a program, we hire a designer, and then we roll through it that way. This one was exactly opposite. We started with a designer, we didn't tell them what to do, we said go out and talk to people and observe these spaces and come back to us with a proposal. So they looked at what was happening from a posture standpoint, um, from a shade standpoint, from a lighting standpoint, um, from a power standpoint. Interesting here, what we found is through this work, what a water feature used to be 25 years ago, a power receptacle is today. People will walk, walk a long, long way to find a power receptacle, the power of their device, which is interesting. Um, nature, if it's well maintained and it's baked into design appropriately, what does that do for the space? <coughs> customization, be it individual customization or group customization in a space. Uh, stuff management, we all carry around bags. You know, we all have places that we need places to put things, and oftentimes we don't want to put them on the ground. Ground's dirty. Um, scale, context, repetition, all of those things are magic, magic in design. And what, what does that do, or how can we leverage that? And then this uh, is interesting to me. As a company, we've always been really dependent on beautifully designed spaces for our product to go in at the last minute, right? And almost like the cherry on the top. We have this kind of aha moment with this work, and we said, what if our, what if our product create, created a beautifully designed space, right? What if we thought about our stuff a little earlier in the specification process instead of at the very end? So what if our products could actually make these spaces? Uh, Shane Cohen, wonderful landscape architect, I'm sure some of you know who he is. He's working with us on a space uh, delineation product or fence program, and it's uh, basically a system that will allow a landscape architect to specify these beautiful fences that will also, the panels will also go on our converter project. So we're looking at what are the sizes, uh, how will we put them together, how will we systematize these so they're affordable for the average client, because we know landscape architects will build these things anyway, but the pain points are the hinges, the door locks, all of the non-glamorous stuff, right, the footings, so we're figuring that out now. And this is an example of a pro program you just did in Minneapolis. So it's perforated steel. And there's, or, uh, this one's copper, uh, which we're never going to be able to sell that. Um, but it's stunning, right? I mean, really beautiful stuff. What we're finding is with trellises, uh, like I just showed you, the converter pro program, with this sort of product, if you have an apple, so we just did a bunch of furniture for the Steve Jobs Theater, the amphitheater, that all came from our company, we worked on it with them. If you have the really deep pockets, you can do anything you want. The reality is, is people that don't have the budget still have the same need set. So the opportunity for our company is to not design for the top 10%, but the 90% below them. So this is an example of what that could look like with him. This is another, this is the same uh, program with just a little different aesthetic or look. So he's playing, playing with layering here. So it's really simple perp patterns, layer it up. And then uh, expansion and contraction of just simple slats to create some pretty cool illusions. And this is a residence in Chicago, which is really cool. And wood, same thing. So for my job, our team has to figure out how do we make this into one sellable system, right? And then lastly, uh, core 10, same exact system with flat panels. And that's it. So that's a little bit about who we are, uh, why we do what we do, how we decide to do what we do, um, who we work with and why. So with that, um, thank you. And if you have questions or comments, I'm happy. I'm right up here. Um, but thank you. So you showed a shot of uh, Western Michigan 
students working outside. <coughs> what kind of stats or trends are you guys looking at? Your, that's being done outside on both campuses and also on corporate campuses. There, there's a huge trend to it and shift to it. There's a lot of attention on it from a from a corporate campus perspective. A lot of it's, I believe, a result of the office furniture industry not being able to rely on panel systems anymore and kind of chunking out the same old thing. That industry is really changing and evolving. And so they're they're being pushed essentially into our space. So they're, they're bringing on lots of smaller kind of boutique, they would consider boutique products. Outdoors would have been not a big enough market for them, but it is now. So now they're really marketing towards institutions, corporate, you name it, saying, hey, there's huge value to that for space. So I expect to see a, a, a lot, a bigger shift towards that. Right now, it's, it's still kind of in the beginning stages. Uh, and then on college campuses, you know, on, at Western, they love our stuff. That was a stage shot, so that doesn't exist. So it's just not happening yet. But I think that's where we come in as manufacturers to say, listen, there, here's some actual product, products that solve these needs, these latent needs. I'm not sure if that was a good answer to your question. Oh, but I think we need to do your first test. Yeah, I love that. We talked about it earlier today, yeah. Question back here. Um, you mentioned how you wanted to make dead spaces alive again. How are you going to do that, especially with the converter, with how it's open panels when it comes to like the winter or late fall or very early spring? It seems like it's only going to be either summer, late yeah. spring, and early fall that it can't be used. Yep. That, so that's a pretty common question, and it's a good question. And you know, we we serve uh, the whole country plus the sand states, plus the UK, and everybody has a weather issue. So if you're in, say, Arizona, they don't use the summer because it's too hot. They use it in the winter. In Michigan or up here, we probably won't use it in the winter. We'll use it in the summer. The funny thing is about usage of outdoor space, and some of the landscape architects in the room might be able to speak to this better than me, but what we believe is if you're in a place that the weather is bad, for the majority of the year. When the weather is good, the usage rate is super high. If you were to average that out over the whole year, say to a space like, I don't know, in North Carolina, where the weather's pretty consistent, it's the, it's the same amount of usage. Does that make sense? So you can't get out as often, but when you do, they're, baby, they're out there, right? Um, so we do see that. And uh, with the Luber product, we can, for rain, we can close it. It's, it's, you know, it's not going to be one of those things where you can kind of build small buildings. I would call it more like transient architecture. So when you can use it, it's there. Yes? stuff that has planned obsolescence for you know in 10 years it's going to be junk. Yeah. That's a that's a problem. For us if our stuff lasts 25, 30 years, that's a good thing. We also try not to kind of co-mingle uh, materials. So we don't we don't rubberize uh, aluminum. We would just keep it pure aluminum. All of our products can be stripped and recycled pretty easily. We don't co co-mingle materials when we don't have to. Um, and if we do they're typically bolted together. Um, in all of our products, I'd say most of them are made out of aluminum or steel or wood. So, and our, our wood, unfortunately, you know, this one's, this is a hot topic. Our wood comes from uh, farms, but if we didn't sell wood, landscape architects probably wouldn't specify our, our products. So we would love to find a wonderful wood alternative. There's just not one out there at the moment that landscape architects love. Does that answer your question? Yeah, we, we do as much as we can. 
I mean, the honest answer is as, as much as we can. We have a, an outdoor um, chair that has a soft cushion, and we've learned about that technology through tugboat bumper manufacturers. <laughs> so if it can last on a tugboat, we thought, well, you can sit on this thing in outdoor space, and it should last fine, and we bolt that on uh, to the chair. So we learned about that from there. We do acetylated wood. We're doing a lot of research around that. Um, it's, you know, as a manufacturer, when we, when we um, decide to design a new product, the first thing we try to do is leverage what we've already invested in. So we're experts at welding steel, grinding steel, casting aluminum. Those are the things we tend to look at first. Um, and then from there, it, it trickles out. So. Go ahead. Two back here. Thanks for the presentation. I, I would like to ask you about your design process again. And yeah. I think you did a beautiful job at kind of guiding us through the steps of that design process and involving a lot of research and um, initial source uh, finding and stuff like that. Um, my question would be, what is your company's culture Concerning failure in the design process. Con I'm sorry, concerning failure. Failure, failure in terms of. Uh, oh yes. Because you mentioned uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of project that get messed up. Yeah, yeah. That's a it's an awesome question and really important because um, we tend to only show the successes. <laughs> I, I did show you one that we don't know how it will turn out to convert. I think um, with our company, failure is completely okay if you don't hide it, cover it up, or sweep it under the rug. If it's a learning moment for all of us and it can make us stronger, which it does if you share it, right, and you're confident in sharing the learning and the outcome, we call it a post-mortem, right? What worked well and what didn't. It's really critical. It's really critical. So failure is not a problem. We just encourage people to do it quickly and cheaply. Well, I mean, we're not a huge company, and uh, companies do a lot of business, you know. Yes? We were talking earlier about um, kind of a unique market segment being campus campus design, and you, you had just said that, you know, you do what landscape architects want you to do, but it strikes me that your observational studies that you have people do reveal something about what people want or what people need. We talked earlier about yeah. how fast people make up their mind about um, an environment that they might be yeah. going to school in for four years. Any insider tips about what what sells on college campuses today? Uh, I think collab collaborative products sell well. Um, I, but let me let me back up. So I'm trying to be 
respectful of the room I'm in. What I would say about landscape architects is they're too nice, honestly. Um, and they're competing against people that aren't oftentimes nice. And they're oftentimes competing against people that have spent years learning how to speak in terms of value to people on all levels of decision making. Um, not just talk about beautiful space, right? Um, all of that's important. What we're trying to do as a company, if you go to our website, is provide that narrative or those talking points through the form of uh, research, uh, thought starters, every kind of tool we can come up with to help landscape architects speak in terms of value to their clients. Because at a time in human history, again, when more and more people are moving into urban areas and the outdoor experience is more important than we believe than ever, we see less budget going to landscape architect. We see more budget going to the indoor experience. Again, where are you going to go on your vacation? Where are you going to retire? Where are some of, some of your fondest memories? They're not of indoor spaces, and that's where we spend the most money. It's not uncommon for people to spend more money on door pulls and door hardware, hinges and handles, than the entire outdoor space budget. That's just hogwash. Someone's not doing their job, right? That's how I look at it, right? And I, and I can complain and grumble, but I would be the guy not doing my job if we weren't out there at least trying to advocate and help. Help people see it differently and offer the tools to become a resource to the profession, which we really believe in and love. That's a lovable group of people. They're wonderful people. I just wish they would have a little bit more tooth in terms of uh, going after it and, and showing the other professions uh, who really should be leading the thinking in these spaces. We see oftentimes interior designers specifying the entire outdoor space. That should never happen. They're unqualified. But they own that. They own the conversation. It's really amazing. So to me, that that's more, um, I, get, I get lit up when I think about this and what we can do. And so we want to provide products that help shock people into thinking about it differently. Because they should. Shame on us for offering benches for so many years. What is that doing? And if we come out with a new bench, how is it better than the old bench? It doesn't make sense. So we're on this, we're in this in pursuit of becoming a resource for the profession, help them, help, help them, help them, help them, and providing solutions that are full of uh, insights on what people want today, not what they wanted 20 years ago. Jeff. Yeah. Um, you showed on one of your slides on your presentation campuses that you visited, do you consider that your company uh, focuses more on um, college campuses, uh, or does it depend on the project that you set? It's, we, we focus on, we call it live, learn, work, care, play, and travel. Those are our markets, and really they are municipalities, parks, things like that. Learn would be this uh, college campus. Uh, work, obviously, is corporate campus. Um, travel is transit, you know, and so on. So it's it's one part, and I would say corporate campus and college campus are very similar to what we're finding. I mean, I didn't. I have another presentation that is full of insights around how younger people want to work, how they want to sit, what they expect, all kinds of fun stuff. So, for example, um, standing height posture promotes informal social interaction. We all know this intuitively. Think about the last holiday party you went to, say Christmas at home. Where do people hang out? The kitchen. They stand by this thing, right? It's really interesting. So if you want to promote informal social interaction, go standing high. Okay, simple. If you want to promote it also, go really low to the ground plane, right? It's the 28 and a half high, it's the conference table, the dining height, that's wildly formal. So if you're trying to encourage strangers to interact, think about that. The other thing I'd say, if you're trying to encourage strangers to interact, don't use round tables. Tell me the last time you sat at a round table with a stranger just walked up and sat down at it. Who does that? No one, right? No one. But yeah, we populate these spaces with round tables expecting that to happen. Well, it's underutilized. You have one stranger at each table and everyone else is standing around wondering what to do. If you want people to use the space, use rectilinear tables. Watch behavior around rectilinear tables. Strangers think nothing of anchoring at each end. You have four strangers at the end of a rectilinear table. It's really interesting. I don't know why this is, and I don't really care, but to me, it's, it's a nonstop source of uh, design inspiration. It's fun. And you know what? I bet you can relate to what I just said. I bet if you think about it, 
you know, I know I've not, I travel all the time and I would never sit with a stranger at a round table. That'd be, that'd be creepy. And you still remember it, and it wasn't a good experience, by the way. Well, that, that's okay, right? When it's planned. Um, but I think what, what I'm getting at more is how do we really think about space differently? And how do we not overcomplicate things? So. Good question. Good question. Good question. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess. So I'm really a big fan of your work, and it really fascinates me how these products are truly innovative. But I have a question regarding on uh, really outreach, because, I mean, your products truly do the speaking, really, because once you see the product, you really want to interact and really have it around places that are needed for these things. But how in your company situation, like what is your outreach? Like is there any form of outreach to get these products out there other than these products exist? Hopefully. Yeah, the reach is always a challenge. I mean, that's the marketing team's work. We do as much as we can with our sales team. I'm here today. You know, as much as we can do. Um, if I could figure that out, that out even better, that would be pr pretty amazing. We're as engaged as we can in the industry and the profession to support it. We're huge sponsors of the LAF. Um, we do trade shows, events. I wish there was uh, a better way to do it. And you know, to, to speak better to, to younger generations, we're finding social media is a huge platform for us and, and more powerful than ever. We do know that people are moving away from brochures and printed pieces, and they're relying solely on the internet. And so to look for our website to be more heavy lifting in the future. But it's a great question. I don't have the answer for that other than I can tell you, give you a laundry list of what we do today. I think Kirk uh, will be around for a little while if we want to have yeah. questions. But I wanted to want to invite everybody uh, into the, the gallery space. We do have a reception uh, or some snacks. Uh, there's also in the lobby, uh, for those of us that need continuing education credit, uh, there's uh, Nixus and the NIA uh, forms to fill out. So uh, thank you again for coming. Yep. And uh, please. Uh, yeah, so I'd say, just in closing, I'm not a professional speaker. I, there's typos in this thing. I trip over my words. This is wildly uncomfortable for me. But if you come to Landscape Forums, you'll, you'll have a blast. And if you want to talk to me offline or send me a note, you'll get a better version of myself. So thanks for putting up with me, and um, thanks for coming. <laughs>